Okay, so we're talking about chapter four, and in, in the previous lectures, I've only done audio, and so this time I'm doing video, looking to see how this will work in within Blackboard. We don't have a lot of space, and videos take up a lot of space. Also, I'm a little sick today. I've been sick for the last week with... Um, that sinus skunky infection stuff. So, excuse me if I cough. I have my tea with me. The chapter that we're talking about is language, and we started our lecture learning about language and the different intricacies of language. And there was one particular, particular pet peeve that I had as an instructor when it came to written language. Can anybody remember what that was? <clears throat> That was students using text, uh, let me put my uh, cup of tea down, using text type of language on their assignments, in their Blackboard assignments, uh, in their discussion board assignments. I know that, for example, discussion board mimics a back and forth talk. However, it's still the context we have to remember is a college classroom and we have to write in college level writing. And um, it's uh, our language, I think one of the comments that we made about language is that if we don't have a word for it, it's not part of our world. We don't know it. And so we made it, I think, all the way down to talking about problems with language. <clears throat> Think of a ladder, you know, so you know how a ladder goes like this and like this. So there is high and low abstractions of understanding of language on that ladder. So if you have a high level of abstraction, it's a little difficult to get the meaning. Whereas if you have a low level of abstraction, you can pretty much get the meaning. So if I say, for instance, mammal. What do you think I'm talking about? I have something in mind that I know I'm talking about. Mammal. But do you know what that is? No, some of you may be thinking different things, but I know you're not thinking what I'm thinking. Well, that's a high level of abstraction. That is, you're not really getting the meaning of it. So if I say four-legged, and we're going to a lower level of abstraction, but still that's pretty high if I just say four-legged. So now I've said mammal, four-legged, what are you thinking? What do you think I'm thinking? And if I say mammal, four-legged, hmm, canine, ah, now what are you thinking? Now you're thinking something different. What were you thinking when I said mammal? What were you thinking when I said four-legged? And what were you thinking when I said canine? Now, but you still, you still don't know what type of canine I'm talking about. So now I say canine that's hyperactive. Canine that jumps a lot. K9, that is smart. Okay, so it's getting a little more specific. However, you don't really know what I'm thinking until I tell you. So I can tell you Rhett Terrier. That's a dog, the type of a dog, Rhett Terrier dog. They're mammals, they're four-legged, they're hyper. <laughs> so what I did was I took it from a very broad, you could, you could add thousands of meanings to mammal, and I kept giving you information and adding to that information to make it more specific, to make it less abstract so that you would understand it. Abstraction can cause us a huge problem when we're communicating with um, significant others, with our best friends, um, when we're talking via technology, we're talking to our parents, we're talking on the job. If we're all talking abstraction, then we're not quite sure if we really all understand what we're talking about. 
we have to learn to add specifics. Now, if you and I have known each other for many, many, many years, we can probably talk in a high level of abstraction and pretty well understand each other. But if we're just meeting and sharing information, then we need to talk at a lower level of abstraction. So if someone says to you, hey, can you get me a Coke? And you don't know that person, how do you know whether you need to get them a Coca-Cola, a 7-Up, a Dr. Pepper, a Sprite? How do you know what to get them? That's a high level of abstraction talking. But if you know them and you know that when they say, hey, can you bring me a Coke, they really want a Dr. Pepper, they're just using Coke in that general term, then you know what to get them, but you might know that person. All right, that's just one problem that can happen in language when we're communicating with each other. And then there's this whole notion of evasion. In evasion, we choose not to give as many details. We evade a lot of details. Let's say that someone that I didn't know wanted to know my schedule. As a matter of fact, somebody did the other day. Someone, someone who wants to be a closer friend than what I'm ready for. I'm just ready for a nice companion friend. Um, and because I have a lot of friends, so I'm very picky about my friends. And um, she wants to go to the mall, she wants to go to the movies, and I have a busy schedule. And so I'm trying to non-verbally tell her, you know, it's I can't be that kind of friend, at least not at this point in my life where I'm so busy. So she wanted to know my schedule, so I said, oh, well, you know, I... I spend the week um, at my full-time job in teaching. Oh, well, what nights do you teach? Well, you know, I teach several nights a week. And um, Well, where do you work? What's your full-time job? Well, I don't know this person very well. I, I don't know why they're asking that question. So I say, oh, you know, I, I work all over for Tarrant County College. And, you know, so what I'm doing is I'm evading answering specific questions because if I, I know if I give her all that information, if I tell her the nights that I teach, what time I go to work, get off work, what I do on the weekends, she's going to find some way to schedule herself in there. And um, she just has different goals for our relationship. She, she just moved to town. She's an educator. She just wants a really good friend. And... and I just can't be that right now. I would love to because I love having friends. I just don't have the time. So what I did was I used evasive language so because I didn't want to hurt her feelings, really, is why I used evasive language. Some people use evasive language <laughs> uh, because they just don't want to answer questions. They don't want you in their business, not that they care about your feelings. Then there is also equivocation. And uh, if you open the PowerPoint, this is slide number eight. Equivocation, equivocation is where we make our words unclear. So you try to say a word so that someone gets two or three meanings from it. For example, if I want to equivocate, somebody asks me to um, go out with them, you know, maybe, um, and it's somebody I don't want to go out with. Maybe he's asked me out. I don't particularly want to go out with him. My equivocation might be, um, sure, I'll uh, join you for um, a meal sometime later. <laughs> well, what meal is that? I don't know. I'm, I'm just, you know, um, wanting him to attach a whole bunch of different meanings to it. And uh, later, you know, I don't want to pin down a time, you know, and there's always that, you know, I'll call you, <laughs> uh, you know, because uh, we're just equivocating. Yeah, I want you to think maybe I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to do it, or I am going to do it, but I don't want you to know if I'm going to do it type of thing. I'm not ready to commit yet. I just want to equivocate. So when someone is saying something to you, and you can't tell whether they mean yes or no. They say yes, no, you know, maybe, I'm not sure if I can do that. Let me check my schedule, maybe not next week. And then you, and if you say, are you equivocating? That means, you are you saying yes and are you saying no and you're not making up your mind? That's equivocation. 
The next problem that we have with language, and it's not always a problem, is we use euphemisms in our language. Euphemisms nicey up some harsh language. What some people might see is harsh language. For example, I don't say in public I need to urinate, defecate, because that's the term for it. I mean, that's the go look in the medical book, urinate, defecate. That's what it's called. We don't say that. We say, I'm going to the powder room. I'm going to the restroom. I mean, who named it restroom? We don't go there to rest. We go there to urinate or defecate. Um, but we use a euphemism to make something sound nicer. So not so harsh. And then slang. When I was in Europe, I went to I went with a group of people. But one night, I just decided to go to a uh, to a place by myself where I could get fish and chips, just to watch the culture, watch the people, see how are we different, how are we the same. And I went in, and I was I wanted to order fish and chips, and um, the lady said you have to be seated at a table. And, and, but it was full. The place was packed. There was there was no table to be had. <coughs> Excuse me. So, I said, okay. I was just going to stand there and wait for a table. She said, I'll be right back. So she went and talked to some folks, and, and I could see them moving over, making a space for me. So, um, I thanked them very much and sat down, and it turned out um, it was the owner. And she was sitting with her friends, and um, the bartender said to, to the woman, to the owner, that um, here's someone, she's visiting from the United States, she just wanted to come experience, you know, culture, and, you know, so I sat down, and I ordered my fish and chips, and she was so nice, and she paid for it, and her friends were around, they were asking me a lot of questions, and one of them made this statement. How do you all feel in the United States that you don't speak proper English? That you have to come over here and learn proper English? And I know that I must have had a, a, a puzzled look on my face because I think I'm speaking English. What she meant was, we speak in a lot of slang. And we use that slang as a natural part of how we speak. Whereas there, they don't. They do speak proper English. So we started talking about the slang. Um, for instance, I had a friend who came from another country who knew English when he came over. And, and he came over, and one day I said, Hey, what's up? And he looked up, and he looked up. And he said, Well, the sky, the, the ceiling. And I started laughing. I said, No, 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 no. What I mean is, How's your day going? What's happening? Everything okay? He said, oh, Alma, that's not English because I was using slang. What's up? So, so much in the United States, we speak our slang. So, uh, you know, unless it's like a different slang from Texas that it is from Louisiana, that it is from California, we might get confused. But um, when we travel for those who have learned a different type of English, they're not accustomed to that slang, so it can be problematic. And then the last one is we talk in a lot of jargon. Jargon is um, DVD, DVR, BRB, LRL, LOL, um, Java, you know, I'm not having some, I'm actually I'm having tea. But if it were coffee, somebody might say, oh, Java, you know, you're having caffeine, you're having a jolt. You know, I'm having some tea. Need a drink. We use a lot of jargon. If you come where I work, we use a lot of jargon. In higher education, we use a lot of jargon. If you go work in welding, they use a lot of jargon. Mechanics use a lot of jargon. Lawyers use a lot of jargon. Sometimes, when I'm putting together a flyer for everyone in our district, all 5,000 people, I have to recheck that flyer to make sure that I haven't inserted HR jargon into it. Uh, and if I have, I have to take it out and spell out the word. 
I was in a meeting the other day where someone was talking, talking, and they said something about H HBCUs. And several of us in the room didn't know what HBCUs were. And so someone asked, what's an HBCU? Well, in the context we were in, the majority of people knew what that word meant, but there were a few of us who didn't. And that is a histori historically black colleges and universities. And so had somebody not asked what HBCUs were, the rest of us would have been lost in the meaning of the conversation because we didn't understand that jargon. Okay. So if you go to slide 11 in the PowerPoint, there's where you see the ladder of abstraction. And there is a really good example for you in abstraction. <coughs> and then I gave you uh, an example as well. <coughs> Let's talk about additional problems with, <coughs> pardon me, this isn't going away anytime soon and I'd never get your lecture done if I just put it off, so patience. <laughs> um, slide number 12, when we talk about situation and meaning semantics, meanings, uh, meanings are in words, not people, which is a very important piece of information that you need to know. Meanings are in people, they're not in words. Meanings are in people, they're not in words. For example, uh, let me try to think of a word that, okay, so let's go back to running. I have a meaning, before I started running, the meaning of running to me was other people. <laughs> other people doing it well. Wow, look at that person in my neighborhood. They are running. Good for them. Good for them. So it was very superficial, running, great. And then I started running. And it started changing my meaning because I started experiencing it. I experienced... I'm running out of breath. I experienced my first runner's high. I experienced having a lactic acid buildup in my thigh muscles. I experienced in my first half marathon pain at mile 13, and but it was pain that I loved. And so now the meaning for running in me is different. It's positive. It's exhilarating. It's frustrating right now because it's been about a week and a half since I've been able to do it because <coughs> of this stuff. <coughs> maybe, maybe a week, not a week and a half. And so right now it's a little frustrating. But whatever experiences you have, you add to that meaning of that word. And so, that's why meanings are in us and not in the words. When we talk about culture, you remember we were, uh, we talk about uh, uh, the word, the acronym that we put on the board. At one time, that word that we had out there with that acronym um, used to, at first it didn't bother me because I really didn't know what it meant, and then I went to college, learned about the word, and then it bothered me, and then now I've, I've rethought that word, and now I teach it, and so my meaning for that one word has changed for me over the years. And so it's not the word that has the meaning, it's what the meaning that I put to that word. Semantics is uh, problems that I see um, in a lot of different settings. We think we're meaning the same thing with that word, and we're not. One of the meetings that I had happened to be about technology, and we were working on technology, trying to get something settled, and the person at the other end of the phone, we were on a conference call, the person at the other end of the phone said, um, you know, we need to make sure to get this integration going. So, in everything I'd read and done and studied for this meeting, we weren't doing a real integration. We were doing a quasi-integration. So I stopped and I said, well, one of the questions that I want to ask is, it seems, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but from everything that I read, 
this isn't a true integration. This is a quasi-integration. It's a, it's a solution so that, that we don't have to go to that deep integration. We're just doing quasi, which in the back end, which means in the back end it just looks like, well, yeah, the, the person on the phone, yeah, that's what we mean. And I said, well, I just, w and this is what I said, I just want to define the way that we are using the word integration because in this room over here, those of us on this side of the phone, we all have a different meaning for it. So I think it's a good idea if we come to an understanding that we are all talking about, when we say just the word integration, we are actually saying quasi-integration. And the person at the other end said, you know, I really appreciate you saying that because I didn't know you all had, that we were all talking in different meanings. When you're talking with anyone, when you're having a communication interaction trying to buy a ticket to fly somewhere, if you are a single dad, a single mom headed to a PTA meeting, if no matter what, <clears throat> if you can sense people aren't understanding each other, hunt for that word, fish for that word or that phrase where people are actually attaching different meanings to it because that can be problematic and then the limits of labeling we always have to we have to label people there's something in our human nature that says we have to label everyone I was in a meeting the other day and um, we were talking about our ethnicities and there's a woman there, and she said, you know, I'm Mexican, and her last name is Mexican, but if you look at, at her, she's very white-complected. And uh, she, she says that people label her as Caucasian because of her skin, and then they attribute her last name to marrying someone who has that last name. But she's never been married. And she said that labeling, people communicate with me differently because they think I'm Caucasian. She said, but when I correct them and tell them that, no, that's my Mexican name, I'm Mexican, my parents are from Mexico, then they have a new label for me and they talk to me in a different way. She said, usually negatively, oh, your people came over, you know, type of, type of thing. We tend to put people in boxes so that we can label that box and then we talk to those people or those things based upon that label. So if I say hot dog, apple pie, baseball, what is the label that comes to mind for you? I'll let you think about that. I'm not going to answer that for you. <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> we have talked about bias language from, by the nature of the example that we had on the board. We talked about being politically correct, so I'm not going to add into that. <clears throat> Probably what we haven't talked about is slide number 14, profanity and civility. Profanity... Sometimes <clears throat> in class, when I'm giving an example that has profanity in it, I'll say, no, we're all adults in this room. There are people who believe, and I couldn't tell you the percentage of people, but there are people who believe that if you use a profanity, then you do not have enough words in your vocabulary to say what you really mean. I'm not saying that's how I think. I'm saying that is what I have heard people say. That if you say shit. Now remember we're adult people. Okay. So I'm giving this as an example. So we tell people eat shit, your shit, uh, your, your shit don't stink, um, um, I don't know, all those, all those words that go with that. There's a whole, whole bunch of words. Well, there are folks over here that say, well, when you say that word, shit, you're saying it because you don't have a proper word in your uh, reservoir of vocabulary over here to really say what you mean. Now, 
There's another population that says profanity is used to make a point. I don't know. What do you believe? I can't tell you what's the right thing to believe. You believe for yourself. What, what I'm telling you is that there are these two sides out there. The middle says, oh, you know, I use it when I need it. Who cares? I don't know how you stand on shit, okay, because um, uh, how you grew up. Maybe you grew up in that household that says we don't use profanity and, um, uh, and, and your parents tell you use your, use your big words. Uh, or maybe you grew up in a home that, I mean, it wasn't total profanity, but there was an occasional something that landed out somewhere. That's up to you. I mean, the book calls it reasonably hostile, but I hear a lot of vulgar language out there that's not used in the assumption of hostility. Some of it's in fun. Listen to, listen to the music we have out there these days. Uh, listen to laughter when people are talking. They're not saying those words to be mean. And then civility. Social norm following appropriate behavior. That sounds easy. That sounds like one of those, isn't that a common sense thing? Don't we know that when we go to church, we sit and we be still and we be quiet? Don't we know that um, when we're riding the bus that we don't sit in someone's lap or we don't talk loud or we don't bring back, we don't bring out an onion and start, uh, you know, eating the onion, you know, causing odor? Um, if civility were... <clears throat> one of those concepts that were so um, common sense in in our world, we wouldn't have detentions in high school. We wouldn't have to have discipline uh, a discipline office in all colleges. We wouldn't have to um, call students on incivil uncivil behaviors. Yes, I have seen a lot of uncivil behaviors in the college classroom. Um, not anything that I could manage and tone down, however. Um, even subtle ones. One that was happening uh, several years ago, there was a female, she would sit on the front row, and she was a little large, and there were two males that were sitting beside her, behind her. I didn't know for six or seven weeks that these males were actually bullying her. I had no idea about that. They would make quiet comments, quiet enough for her to hear, not for me to hear, not for people around to hear, and they would make fun of her. Well, one day, um, while I was lecturing, I saw some tears streaming, and um, I asked her to stay after class. I told her I wanted to talk to her about a paper. So no one would say anything. So everyone else left out of the classroom, and I said, Are you okay? Is there something that you want to talk about? And she said, No. And I said, You know, if I really thought I said something to offend her. And I said, If I've said something to offend you, I, I really apologize. And she said, No, it's those jerks behind me. I said, What? So she told me what they were doing. So I had to send them an email, call them in, and talk to them. And I told them that uh, if this is what was happening, um, they might want to talk to me about it. Of course, they weren't saying anything. Because they weren't saying anything, it really led me to believe they really were doing this. Um, they didn't defend themselves. They didn't say they weren't doing it. I said, um, because you're the ones who are doing this, um, I really should ask you to leave the class. However... Uh, this other student, the female student, says, if you will just move away from her, not make eye contact with her, I won't put y'all in groups. And if I catch you, any, at any one time, either one of you doing a nonverbal or trying to whisper something to this young lady, I will escort you out of the classroom to the police station, and they can take you to. Um, actually, the two males uh, dropped the class because they knew they could not do that to her. But... Civility in classrooms is something that I have to watch and work on because sometimes we don't realize 
that um, students don't realize they're being uncivil to each other. I had a case the other day in a class where a young man, his name is Leeway, and I heard a student say, your name is Leeway? And then he went, ha, 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 ha. So I had to send an email to that student to remind everybody we don't make fun of people's names because that's uncivil behavior. All right, so I think that we've talked about context. We and uh, we've talked about formal and informal communication, uh, relational communication. Um, I've talked about a hit on with the example when we were talking about ladder and linguistics. Um, I touched on the sapir wharf hypothesis when I said that um, that our words, our world isn't made up until we have a word for it. And that's what the sapir wharf hypothesis is. And if you notice, it's not a theory. A theory is different from a hypothesis. A theory is a hypothesis that's been proven over and over and over again. The hypothesis has just never, there's no way to prove it. But... Uh, because it can't be disproven and it has been around for many years and many many researchers have tried to disprove it and because they cannot disprove it it is uh, known as the Sapir Whorf hypothesis and Sapir and Whorf were the two um, researchers that were working on this and it says that our culture influences the way we think first of all we need words to build our world but then we have a culture uh, for instance in higher education, that's a culture. Uh, I have a culture of language that I speak in higher education. I talk about SLOs. I talk about assessment. I talk about um, student opportunities for learning. And all that is language based around that culture. And all of us in this culture speak this language. And if you're not in the culture, you can't do the culture. You have to be in the culture to understand the words that happen within that culture. So, for instance, if you are a gamer, and I, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the most popular uh, games out there that are being played. I don't know. Is one called Megadeth? Is one called, um, I don't know, but... Uh, World of Worlds or something, a war of worlds, I don't know. Anyway, you can tell I'm not a gamer because I can't speak the language. I'm not in the culture. That was a great example. <laughs> but uh, let's say that you are, you play cards, you're in a bridge organization, or you are a swimmer and you're in a swimmer's organization. You all speak that language. Sometimes what I see is High school students coming in have a different language. And there's a clash sometimes with college students and college language and high school students coming in learning the college language. For example, a credit hour, um, uh, your, your degree plan, the, the different degree plans that you can have your transfer credits, your major, your minor, a lot of that is new language to high school students. A lot of this type of lecturing is new. And so until a freshman learns the culture of doing college, it makes it a little difficult to understand the world. All right, so th that is our lecture. So what we had was we had lecture in class and then this is our final lecture and remember that you can download the PowerPoint there are notes I was talking with another student this week and so I think along with um, the PowerPoint I will upload these notes however the reason I hadn't uploaded these notes before is what I don't want to happen is that you're not reading the text because questions can come from the text and um, as I found I can also add questions and change those questions as I did with a couple of questions in the chapter 4 quiz so that's what I will be doing from now on 
and I might pull a specific example from our lecture here. So you need to be sure that you're reading the text, getting the PowerPoint, getting those notes that I'll upload for you, and then taking notes in the lecture in order to be successful, okay? All right, let's hope this works. I did it all in one setting instead of breaking it up. So if this doesn't work in one big long setting, then, um, then I'll break it up later, okay? All right, thanks.